Pyro Medical Radio is online. Hi, welcome to Pyro Medical Radio. Well, the President gave the State of the Union address tonight, and in honor of this grand occasion, we thought we'd share a little State of the Union address history. Now, Article 2, Section 3 of the U.S. Constitution says that the President from time to time has to report to the Congress about the State of the Union. And that's exactly what President George Washington did. And as the first president of the Union, he stood in front of Congress, as President Obama did tonight, in order to deliver an address on the state of the Union as it exists. Thomas Jefferson, though, he took a different take on that. He said that standing before Congress or the legislative body would be too king-like. So he wrote his, as did every following president until Woodrow Wilson, who had no problem being king-like decided he was going to stand once again and reinstitute the practice of giving the Congress the report directly. And so that brings us to today where lots and lots of media frenzies leading up to today being Obama's sixth presidential State of the Union address. Absolutely. Now we want you to notice a few key things that we noticed as we watched the address. Number one, there's a lot of strategic camera angles used throughout the speech. Also, John Boehner seems to have just eaten a lemon every time you see him. Every shot. And when the president wants to humanize a policy, he'll show us a sympathetic face. We're gonna see an astronaut, a hardworking mom, and a soldier when key policy initiatives come up. Let's set it up so we can break it down. Here's the State of the Union address. But tonight, we turn the page. After a breakthrough year for America, our economy is growing and creating jobs at the fastest pace since 1999. Our unemployment rate is now lower than it was before the financial crisis. More of our kids are graduating than ever before. More of our people are insured than ever before. And we are as free from the grip of foreign oil as we've been in almost 30 years. The shadow of crisis has passed. Now we noticed that the first seven minutes or so of the speech was a positively optimistic assessment of the state of the Union. The Union is strong, we have a breakthrough economy, Afghanistan is over, and the shadow of crisis has passed. But if all that's so good, then uh, why are we giving any more of the speech? It's done, right? Wrong. Actually, the president's going to spend another hour talking about how bad the system is and how many problems there are that need to be solved. Thankfully, he has all the answers. So let's look at the major theme of this speech, middle-class economics. So the verdict is clear. Middle-class economics works. After President Obama has just talked about how amazing our economy is, how vital the economy is, we have this story. And President Obama spends a lot of time talking about it because he wants you to connect emotionally with their story. You identify that it's like you, the things you went through, because this is what we like to call emotional manipulation. Seven years ago, Rebecca and Ben Erler of Minneapolis were newlyweds. She waited tables, he worked construction. Their first child, Jack, was on the way. They were young and in love in America. The story has absolutely nothing to do with the rest of the policies he's about to promote. That's right. The story is meant to wear down Americans' resistance to greater government involvement in their individual lives. Just imagine he gave you this nice, warm, fuzzy tail while he was holding a gun. Because that's what government is. It's force. All of these policies he's going to propose and all this increased spending will be done through greater taxation, which is force, which means more money to the government from you. So now that President Obama's pulled on our heartstrings, now he's gonna actually get into some policies. So what does middle-class economics require in our time? First, middle-class economics means helping working families feel more secure. It means helping folks afford childcare, college, healthcare, a home, retirement. And my budget will address each of these issues, lowering the taxes of working families and putting thousands of dollars back into their pockets each year. It's not a nice to have, it's a must have. That's what middle class economics is. Here we have middle class economics, where uh, we have guaranteed childcare, we have guaranteed sick leave, 
We have guaranteed maternity leave. We have guaranteed health care. All these guarantees, but no, no mention of who's going to pay. Yeah, these things cost money, President. Who's going to pay for it? Are you going to pay for it? Oh, that's right. You'll pay for it by taking money from we, the taxpayers. And the fact is, these businesses are going to have to deal with the cost. That's right. Well, these are really, you know, although we're talking about the middle class, these are continuation of Linda B. Johnson's War on Poverty, which has failed. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And now we're including the middle class, only that the poverty line has risen. Not to mention, the president didn't say anything about the $18 trillion debt. Not one time in the speech tonight. Who's going to pay for all this free stuff? So obviously, it's going to be our kids and our grandkids and our great-grandkids. They're the ones who are going to shoulder the burden for whatever we decide to vote ourselves today. And that's why I'm sending this Congress a bold new plan to lower the cost of community college to zero. Mr. President, be honest with the American people. You know nothing's free. $60 billion for this free community program you're going to take from us to give back to us. Makes no sense. The general assumption here is that you have to have a degree to find a job. Where in our current economy, there are a lot of overqualified, highly trained, highly skilled individuals that can't find a job because of their level of qualification. We all know that the more people that have a college degree, the less valuable they become until everyone has a college degree. So what will it mean? Nothing. Nowadays, a master's is what a bachelor used to be because there's so many degrees out there already. And in the immortal words of Syndrome from The Incredibles, when everyone is special, then no one is. And once again, not one mention of the debt. All this does is add to the debt. That makes the economy worse for every job seeker out there who went through college. We're demonstrating the power of American strength and diplomacy. The next focus of the State of the Union address is war. The continuation of never-ending war and global police policies. Just funny, given that the president said this. We're upholding the principle that bigger nations can't bully the small. What exactly are we doing around the world? <laughs> you try to answer that question. Well, here's just a few of the war policies that the president wants to continue and expand. We will continue to hunt down terrorists and dismantle their networks, and we reserve the right to act unilaterally. There are no guarantees that negotiations will succeed. And tonight I call on this Congress to show the world that we are united in this mission by passing a resolution to authorize the use of force against ISIL. And I keep all options on the table to prevent a nuclear run. But we will succeed. So the president talks this big game about establishing peace around the world, but in reality his rhetoric is just the opposite. He assures us that he has no issues whatsoever in being the bully. and. He said that he unilaterally wants all options to be available on the table. So the troops will never come home and the foreign policies will never substantially change. At home and abroad, the story appears to be the same for the upcoming year. Surveillance, war, sanctions, rinse and repeat. But there was one ray of light in all of the rhetoric that was spilled out tonight. And that was that, the news of Cuba. And on Cuba, we are ending a policy that was long past its expiration date. He's been working on this for a little while. It was announced a few weeks ago that he was going to remove the sanctions against Cuba. And I think that's a great idea. Yeah, 50 years worth of sanctions obviously didn't have the intended effect. So let's, right. let's just stand that. And maybe our pseudo free market capitalism can seep into the culture down there and cause some change. Maybe the people get a taste of freedom and it will make a difference. And it's not gonna cost any additional taxes to make this happen either. So it's a great, a great deal. Plus it'll probably, it'll be a boost to their economy. Plus, hey, Cuban cigars. I'm sure lots of people are excited about that. So to summarize the State of Union address, like many of its recent predecessors, it offered general platitudes squished between nuanced catchphrases and policy names with no substantial change to policy in general. Look, we think most Americans would like to see a president who understands his proper role within the executive branch and would like to see Congress scale back his power to within its constitutional bounds and get out of the lives and business of the American people. This is good news, people.
This is natural. I always like this baby. Hi. Here's the State of the Union address. Delivered by President Obama. Everything is cool and team. We're recording. Oh. My fellow Americans. Now do you feel all warm and fuzzy? Ba-dum-boom-tch.